Winner of an astounding seven Academy Awards, Gary Rydstrom, film director and sound designer with Skywalker Sound, has built a career of using innovation, imagination, and technology to help bring to life some of the most beloved cinematic stories of the last 40 years. Gary has worked with some of Hollywood's biggest directors, including Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Ron Howard, and James Cameron, and his career encompasses a wide range of films, including Saving Private Ryan, Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., Titanic, Mrs. Doubtfire, and a host of films in the Star Wars, Terminator, and Indiana Jones franchises. Hello, I'm your host, Paul Teese, and recently had the good fortune to sit down with Gary, who just finished working on his latest project, Spielberg's retelling of the classic West Side Story. We discuss Gary's career and the lessons he's learned as an innovator, the role of playfulness in the creative process, and what keeps him motivated to continue delivering superior results. Well, Gary, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. And uh, I know you're really busy and with you've got a lot of projects. I think, are you, you're working on West Side Story right now? Is that correct? Yeah, we've just, we've just finished West Side Story. It comes out in theaters in December. And uh, it's one of the many movies that have been delayed coming out to the mm-hmm. world because of the pandemic. But our part's done. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm not talking out of turn. It's really great. So, I, oh well, yeah. I mean, as, well, the can't wait for it, yeah, I can't wait for it to be on the big screen, literally big screens, and seeing the way it should be seen. Wow. Yeah, and I, it's amazing. And it must have been somewhat of a surreal pro- process too to be, you know, I mean, it's it's one of the iconic films of the cinematic history, and then you know, and then you you throw in Steven Spielberg and professionals such as yourself. I mean, I'm sure it's just going to be amazing, but it must have been somewhat surreal to be involved in a project like that. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, you know, such a beautiful, I mean, there's some worries about, you know, remaking something that people remember fondly, but it's such, the West, West Side Story as a piece of art itself is such a beautiful piece of work. Mm-hmm. That it, it deserves additional treatment and it deserves someone like Spielberg who if you think about it has never directed a musical before yeah and um, you can I think most people aware of his work would say he's probably going to be really good at it and he is yeah no for sure I think the closest he ever came was probably uh Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom with that whole uh with the whole nightclub uh the whole nightclub uh uh, scenario at Temple Obi-Wan or or Club Obi-Wan so well, so thank you for joining me. I, you know, just kind of jumping in, uh, you know, thinking about the creative process. Are there design principles that you are drawn to that could be potentially applicable to other disciplines beyond sound design? Well, I, I don't know if the, I, maybe this is applicable. I, sound, sound work has the potential to take you down the road of doing things with technology more than because technology is so much a part of what we do in sound. And so you can lean on that too much. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is applicable to other other design or artistic endeavors, but I my approach to sound design is to find interesting sounds from the real world and manipulate them, sure, but as little as possible because the organic nature of you know the real sounds that we're surrounded with mm-hmm. are amazing. And technology sometimes gets in the way. And I, I find that technology for its own sake starts to sound like technology and as opposed to something real. And so uh, that's that's my philosophy for sound. As much as I love technology, I love I love reality. I like you know, mm-hmm. yeah, um, it's that's fun. And, and to make that work in sound, you have to explore. If I'm going to say I'm going to try to find interesting real sounds, I've got to find ways to find those sounds wherever they might be. So that that exploration part of the job is is really important. To, you know, to sort of let yourself be open to listening to things and finding things out in the real world. So, so I find that to be exploring using real sounds and using technology as like a spice, not, not, not the be all and end all. Mm. You know, and it's, it's amazing, you know, the, the, the way that you take those real sounds and you blend them together. And, you know, so I, uh, one thing I had seen and people can see this for themselves. Uh, there's a video on YouTube where you discuss, you know, how you made uh, the dinosaur sounds from Jurassic Park. And it's a combination of like animals such as tortoise and goose and dog and walrus and dolphin. And it's, you know, so it's like the question is, you know, what spirit of exploration leads you to think this dinosaur should sound like eight different animals? You know, like, how do you get to, how do you get there? 
uh, I remember the first thing I did in Jurassic Park is I bought one book on dino, on animal vocalizations. I figured I should learn something about what scientists know about animal vocalizations. So I learned a couple of really simple facts about animals when they are, when they are aggressive versus being passive, if they're dangerous versus being friendly or communicative. You know whether it's like full range. You know, a lion roar is a pink noise. <laughs> That's that. Those kind of sounds are aggressive and more pure sounds. Are, are more communicative and, and friendly, really. So in Jurassic Park, the brachiosaurs sound like singing because mm -hmm. they're gentle. And then the T-Rex sounds like a lion. <sighs> so I, I started off by doing at least that kind of research. And I took, you know, Ben Burt, who sort of uh, led to Skywalker Sound through his sound design of Star Wars. I remember when he started, he had a four track tape machine and he would layer sounds, mm -hmm. take a sound, put it on, put another sound, put another sound, and then layer and blend these sounds into something new. That's how he made lightsabers and, and, and spaceships and things. Mm -hmm. So, and I, with this digital technology, I was able to layer sound. So uh, I would layer animal sounds. So the first step is record a bunch of animal sounds and then play, just sit with, in this case, a single beer and call up geese and donkeys and, and lions and alligators and start blending them together. And my approach was to orchestrate it like music would orchestrate so that the layers would occupy different frequency ranges. So you'd have a low animal, a mid animal, a high pitched animal, mm -hmm. and you just play until they kind of focus into something unique. It was a matter of exploration too. There was exploration in the field and there's exploration in the studio. And that's what that was. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And then, the, you know, to use, you know, like a musical instrument, like the synclavier, there's that element of playfulness you know, to that, to that explorative process, how do you cultivate that? And like, how, how would you, you know, maybe coach others that they, you know, to kind of cultivate a spirit of playfulness in their innovation process? Well, I think playfulness is really, really key. One of the, one of the things I try to do is not be hard on myself because sometimes playfulness means you're doing something stupid. You know, you're, just, you're like, if you're trying to do something new, you're going to, you just got to let yourself do something stupid. You know, you got to try something. Oh, this seems crazy. When I, when I, and, and when I organize for a sound crew to cut sound effects, we, we, we separate premixes. So we have AFX premix, BFX, CFX to cut sounds in, in different layers. Mm -hmm. And I always used to have an HFX. HFX to me was the premix where I wanted the editor to just do something crazy, you know, just try something it, even if it seems insane, just try an idea, a sweetener for a punch that you would never expect or, you know, weird sound for the ambience or an off screen, anything. So th the playfulness, you want to, you want to let yourself do it, but you got to let other people do it. And I, I learned early in my sound design career, I would try to make, here's a sound moment in the movie. I would make the full sound. So it's just, here's the sound, give it to an editor and they would cut it. And that, seemed after a while it seemed limiting they're able to play so then i went to this approach where i make what i consider a toy box so different bits of sound i literally put it into you know a way for them to pluck out sounds it's organized in different kind of categories but it's meant to be a toy box you just pull things out and just see what you find and and it, you know toy box is meant to be kind of inspiring to let someone feel like it's okay to play so mm -hmm. i changed my approach over the years to not only let myself play but let the rest of the sound crew play too and i'm, I'm sure it's just kind of like th that freedom to explore and play you know just added like un unforeseen moments or like texture and you know, just something new and beautiful kind of emerged. It's like, I would never have paired that sound. Like, you know, for instance, I would never necessarily think goose, tortoise, and walrus, and I'm going to blend them together to make a dinosaur. But, you know, just that, that, that ability to be unlimited and allowing yourself to kind of explore, you know, the tools at hand. And even mistakes, you know, people, you know, mistakes sometimes are wonderful. I remember we were mixing a movie we were directed by Dennis Hopper years ago and you would make mistakes and, you know, sort of throw in the wrong thing or get the faders wrong or be feedback or something crazy. And we'd go back to fix it. And Dennis Hopper being Dennis Hopper, go, don't fix it, man. It's great. <laughs> Leave it. And so just never touch that again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not only be playful, but allow mistakes to happen. And if mistakes work, go with them and take mm -hmm. credit later on as much as you can. 
Oh, that's amazing. That's funny. It, it, you you reminded me. It's and and I, I guess it's because it's summertime. But and this is just off off topic. But when Steven Spielberg was shooting Jaws back in seventy four, you know seventy five, and there's that whole scene with Martin Brody, right, with Roy Scheider and the little boy. The little boy, his son, is mimicking him at the dinner table. If you remember that, and it's like it's a it's a minute long sequence that was not scripted. And was not intended to be in the movie, but they just did it during, you know, during outtakes. And Roy Scheider was like, hey, you know, Steven, you need to see this and watch this. And Spielberg seeing the, the beautiful moment of how it really, without words, captures the essence of the Brody family dynamic and just the import of like what that family meant, you know, in the context of Jaws and everything. It was just beautiful. But without that spirit of play, and J.J. Abrams talks about this in the TED talk, but it's like without that ability to just kind of allow yourself to go there, like the movie would have just really missed like a key moment, a texture that made Jaws such a special film, you know. So and you could argue that that moment between father and son is the best moment to tell you what the relationship is like better than any of the scripted or planned out moments, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah. And then there again, the, the key is Spielberg being open to doing it as yeah. opposed to saying this wasn't what we planned on, let's not do it. So, that openness is key to. Oh, yeah. So kind of flipping that a little bit, you know, what, what was a challenge you encountered in your career that was particularly instructive in how you approached future projects? Well, very, very early on, one of the first sound design jobs I got was on Cocoon, the movie. I was just kind of learning how to do sound stuff at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was this, the aliens in that movie had the glow, but they're friendly aliens. In fact, one of the aliens, you know, you kind of, you kind of fall in love with. So mm-hmm. they're happy, friendly aliens. And I, I was, I had, was dating uh, Cindy who became my wife and I, she had just graduated from college and I bought her these really nice, more than I could afford champagne glasses. And so I did the glass harmonica trick with the, you know, putting your finger on the top rim and putting some water and getting those nice glow sounds. And she also played the flute. Mm-hmm. I had her play the flute for me and then play it in sort of non-musical but evocative kind of glowing ways. Mm-hmm. And it worked great for this alien glow. And what it made me realize is both is really fun to take sounds from your life mm-hmm. in a movie. And then you see them in the It's still amazing to me. Take a sound, your, your champagne glass or your dog or your <laughs> door creak, and you see it in the movie and you go, wow, <laughs> magical about that. Looking for sounds from your own life, from you know, sounds of the world that mean something to us as a species and use them in a way that people don't know you're using. In Ad Astra, one of the last movies I did, there was all this subliminal work because uh, uh, Brad Pitt's trying to go after his long lost father, Tommy Lee Jones, and his father son story, very psychological. And a lot of the ambiences in the spacecraft on his journey to go see his crazy father. Mm-hmm. were made from stretched out sounds taken from Tommy Lee Jones' dialogue from the movie. So the ambiences, it's almost like he can't escape his father. Mm-hmm. So using subliminal sound, I found to be really effective. And I learned that on Cocoon. Mm, wow. So what is a project you're especially proud of and why? One film that always stuck out to me that I was really proud of it's okay to be proud i guess of your stuff but is ai the spielberg ai film mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was a way for me to work with kubrick with <laughs> i had no other way to work with kubrick since he was you know, the progenitor of that uh, that mm-hmm. story and it, was, it had a very sort of kubrickian feel to it mm-hmm. but i'm proud of it because very often a sound designer would be told on a movie so stay away from tones stay away from tones because it'll interfere with the score and uh, AI was the tone of the movie felt very fable, like for, felt very magical and child story, not your normal science fiction movie. Mm-hmm. I did Minority Report around the same time, very different kind of gritty feel from Minor- Minority Report, while AI had a magic kind of a just a being told a, a bedtime story kind of feel to it mm-hmm. uh, uh, in the look of it and the feel of it. So we ended up doing a tons of musical sound effects and the trick there is not to interfere but to work with the john williams score so i was proud of the work that we did that were (laughs) 
not staying away from tonalities, but using tonal sound effects and musical rhythms and then working within the score to, to give that movie a, I think in the end, it gives that movie, the soundtrack gives that movie a very unique feel. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? I mean, so is it like the film is shot and then it's scored and then you come in and layer in the sound afterwards then? So you're privy to like what John Williams scores. I mean, like how it plays during the scenes or. You usually, and sadly the score comes in so late that we don't have time to work with it as much as we would like to it comes mm -hmm. in around the final mix and we've done our work and there's a bit of a clash and then kind of a scramble to make them work together. Mm -hmm. AI, what made it also made it special was the John Williams score was recorded early for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. So we had it. And what a blessing on that movie to have this. It was a beautiful score. Yeah. And the score. And then we could work with it, you know, sort of it was it was so it was a matter of both timing. So we had the music early and then we had we wanted to take an approach that was a musical approach to the sound effect. So it worked out. And I think it and it fit the film. So I'm very happy that how that turned out. Yeah, no, it was a beautiful film and and very different from Minority Report, which was, you know, such a, like a cautionary tale and just amazing, too. They're both like these cutting edge science fiction films that Spielberg produced. I think within the same year or within a year of each other or so, but very, very different views of the future for sure. So my last question for you, you know, you have achieved so much in your career. I mean, and this is, this is just kind of mind boggling to me, um, but 19 Academy Award nominations, uh, seven Oscars, and your resume includes some of the most iconic films of the modern era, like Saving Private Ryan, you know, Jurassic Park, Toy Story, Terminator 2. Through all of it, how do you stay motivated to continue to work hard, play hard, and deliver superior results? Well, I think it's, I, I think I've been really lucky. I think the thing that motivates me over, over time is variety. Mm -hmm. And those films you mentioned, I mean, I've worked on films that are radically different. And, you know, from everything Toy Story to Strange Days, you know, it, 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 there's some broad range, which mm -hmm. allowed me to not just get caught in a rut and say, I do this kind of action adventure and that's all I'm going to do. I got to do, you know, quiz show with Robert Redford and, and uh, I did a Hulk with Ang Lee and, and, you know, all these radically different films and radically different filmmakers. So that keeps me going because it gives you this new challenge. Like I got to come up with a, some way to do this that fits this filmmaker and this style in this film. So variety is really important to me. And, it, you know, the person I work with most these days is Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And he himself is the most variety producing director I can think of. It's amazing if you think about the, the variety of movies he's made. So even if I did nothing but Steven Spielberg movies from now on, I would have variety baked into my career. Mm -hmm. So I think that's key. And if you don't feel like you're getting it, you should search it out because it, it really stirs your creative juices to have this, you know, keeps you going and, and keeps you, you know, not getting stuck with your old tricks over and over again. You, you have to force to... Uh, get out of them the other thing that keeps me going is that i've gotten along in my career is to mentor people coming along behind me so that i feel like whatever things that i'm passionate about thinking about filmmaking and sound feels mm -hmm. like some degree it's passed on um, or helping other people discover their own way of kind of making sound i love that i love seeing what what other filmmakers and other sound people are doing and and, and sort of reacting to it but helping helping them get get their careers going and seeing what they do and watching that they and they do things so differently than I do. And that's I think that's really cool. So mentoring at this stage of a career, mentoring is the thing that keeps you going. Mm, that's great. Well, Gary, thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and sharing your insights on the on innovation and the creative process and, you know, just walking through uh, what's going on behind the scenes with some of these great films that we all love and, you know, we've all grown up with. So uh, I really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. It was fun talking to you. Uh -huh.